I officially welcome you all to the uh, final session of the Project Heroes organized by the Rotary Club of NIBM together with Ed Scale Up. And uh, starting from the 27th of March, we have been covering up uh, various sections on industry and uh, involving more than 25 panelists around seven sessions. So we are here for the last panel discussion regarding uh, in the Project Heroes. And I personally welcome, like to welcome Ms. Sandra, Ms. Sandra, Dr. Rohan Tatukorala, Ms. Rasini, and Ms. Arus. So I think uh, uh, for the better introduction and to get on with the panel discussion itself, I invite our moderator for the day, Lahiruni Ekanayaka, to take over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravindra, for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session on career opportunities for women in the corporate sector and leadership development. So it's a pleasure and an honor for me to moderate this discussion, along with the presence of some of the most established personalities in the field. And before we move into the proceedings of the day, let me tell you a little bit about our esteemed panelists. Uh, Dr. Rohanda Atukorala is the Regional Chief Executive Officer of the Global Artificial Intelligence Company, ClueTrack, for Sri Lanka, Maldives, Pakistan, and the Commissioner for Marketing at the National Olympic Committee of Sri Lanka. He's a multiple Paul Harris Fellow of Rotary International and was twice awarded the Exceptional Rotarian of the Year and recently won the Global Heroes of Action Award in 2021. He was also the youngest chairman to be appointed to the Sri Lanka Export Development Board. Dr. Rohanta, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. And up next is Sandra de Soiza. So she's the Group Chief Customer Officer at Dialogue Axiata with three decades of experience and expertise within the mobile and telecommunication industry. She's the only certified customer experience professional in Sri Lanka, and she was the ambient experience leader for the year 2020. She's a visiting lecturer at the University of Colombo School of Computing and the founder member and board member of Women's Chamber for Digital Sri Lanka and also the past vice president of the Sri Lanka Institute of Service Management. Sandra, we warmly welcome you to the panel. Thank you. And Rasini Bandara is a psychologist who is working as a mental health care professional for Mind Heals. She's also a public speaking and personality development coach under her brand, Learn the Art of Public Speaking. She has been working as a visiting lecturer since 2013 for the Rhodes Scholars Program for Scholars from USA and Canada. She has completed her master's in applied psychology from Coventry University, United Kingdom, and presently reading for her postgraduate diploma in international relations at the Bandaranaika Center for International Studies. Rasini, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, Arus Mohammed. Yeah. And Arus is a branding expert, strategist, operational specialist, and a human catalyst with over 21 years of corporate career in sales, marketing, and corporate management. He's currently serving as the chief executive officer and board director of Rainco, and he had worked in healthcare and lifestyle accessories sectors in not only Sri Lanka, but United Kingdom and Bangladesh. He's a chartered member of the British Psychological Society and a member of the American Marketing Association. Arus, it's good to have you here with us today. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, let me start off straight with the very first question of the day. So we have actually divided this uh, panel into like the, the areas at hand into four main sections. First, on the journey of women in corporate leadership. Secondly, on the importance of work-life balance. Thirdly, gender inequality. And finally, ingredients that make a successful leader. So now, if, we, if I talk about the very first question of the day, as in, I understand that all of you are established personalities in the field. You have performed exceptionally in the, in the career. And uh, I would like to ask every one of you, what are some of the biggest challenges that you had to face in your journey through the career ladder? I'd like to start with um, Sandra. Um, yeah, well, when I think of my long career, um, I can't think of the number of challenges and how brave they were because uh, challenges have been very, very many along the way. Um, but 
I can tell you one or two that you may gain courage from and strength from to know that, uh, you know, in my early 20s, when I first joined the industry that I am still in, uh, as a longer serving, I think, uh, member in Sri Lanka from any, any um, one in the mobile phone industry, uh, I am now the longest serving. So when I first joined the first company that brought mobile telephone into Sri Lanka, Celtel, uh, in 1989, um, I was recruited by the, the, the you know, the foreign um, uh, uh, strategist and the marketing consultant uh, and the CEO that came on board. Soon after, there were um, two local uh, gentlemen, you know, who came and took on their job. That was to be my boss. Uh, but I was the only girl. There were nine other, um, uh, you know, boys working with me. And immediately they told me that, I shouldn't be doing this job because it's a technical product. I am very young uh, in my early 20s. Of course, so were the boys. They were so, you know, probably mid 20s. Uh, but that uh, people won't take me seriously because I'm a girl and I'm very young and uh, stuff like that, right? And I'm and, and that it's technical and I have to meet CEOs, uh, board members, and that I they won't take me seriously. Um, so so they have a biases like this immediately. Uh, one, the fact that I was too young, another, the fact that I was a girl, right? Uh, and a third one being that if it is something that has to do with technology, that women are not good with technology, right? So three uh, biases that worked against me. I, literally, I had to leave the job. But when I went back home and told my father, you know, I'll have to leave uh, because they are saying all these things to me and they've given me a choice otherwise of doing a back office job. My father said, no, you just sit there and stay there and fight. Don't give up. Uh, it's too early in your career to give up. You just stay there and fight and show, you show them that you're as good as the boys or even better than the boys. So that's actually what I did. I stayed um, through a very difficult time because I didn't have uh, the support of my own bosses. Uh, but I stayed on. I fought through. And I very accidentally walked into the career that I'm in now because I had to do like support. And then I formed what it was that I called the customer service industry back then by doing, uh, you know, supporting my customers, supporting the sales guys and doing a support kind of role, right? Which was actually customer service. Um, so I accidentally fell into the job that I have succeeded in, excelled in for the last 30 years. Uh, yes, that I was think, one of my biggest challenges. Yes, I think Sandra, that is indeed insightful because I think you spoke about some of the major challenges that are faced by young women undergraduates as soon as they're out of university and they want to pursue that uh, pursue avenues that are related to the corporate sector. I mean, not just with the corporate sector, but all these gender biases, these stereotypes, they are like, you know, the social stigma. It's typical yeah. in Sri Lanka, but I think we have come a long way from that now, but yeah. So it is indeed enlightening to hear. And uh, Arus, any comments based on your personal experiences about one or two of the challenges that you have faced? Yeah, so just like Sandra mentioned, uh, obviously there could be many, but um, I actually wanted to just pick one uh, or maybe two. One is that um, most importantly, how to keep a sight on your vision and how to stay on track. You know, this is a challenge that is always thrown at us because we all start with uh, a lot of ambition uh, when we were young. Uh, we build, uh, you know, a lot of uh, dreams and a lot of everyone will ask you the question when you are young. The first thing when you're schooling or you're out of school, people will ask you the question of what do you want to be, uh, you know, in life? What is your aim? What is your ambition? So uh, at that time, uh, you know, uh, we all come up with those um, very, um, you know, so-called those attractive careers. You know, 20 years ago, uh, either you be a doctor, you be an engineer, you be a lawyer, or you be an accountant. Those are the career options. If you don't go into any of those, people consider that you're inferior, or you feel you have a perception that uh, if you don't become a doctor, that's not that's not very good of yourself. But uh, so one of the greatest challenges is to how do you then keep a uh, keep a sight on your vision as to what you want to be. It is not the profession. It is it is not uh, how much you earn. It is not the monetary gain. But uh, overall. I think today we will discuss a lot about the leadership in, in itself. How do you be a leader that, that can make an impact? So for me, um, I mean, with all those challenges, you're, you're so new in walking into the corporate uh, career, corporate sector, um, you don't know. There are a lot of don't knows than what you actually know. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of young graduates who's listening in today would probably have the same kind of challenges. So that's why I thought I'll relate to this challenge. 
Uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, success is not one straight line up there. And those of you who's looking at the leaders who are sitting in front of you, just like Sandra or Dr. Rohanta or Rasini, uh, I mean, you shouldn't get uh, misperceived thinking that, okay, I mean, along the line, I can go and end up there. It's not going to be one straight journey. It's always ups and downs. So how do you envision yourself uh, and to be your best self despite all odds? Uh, this is going to be a challenge. It was a challenge for me. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a challenge for all of you. And I'm sure the same thing would have been a challenge for all the leaders who are sitting. We did not just parachute from, from the sky. It, it is a very painful process, but it's all worth it at the end of the day, because when you become a leader, when you become that figurehead, you can influence, not just influence, but you can inspire many more to follow you. So I think how can you change your game, game plan, but not your goal? Always remember that uh, to really overcome that challenge is uh, stick to your vision, stick to your goal. You can keep trying out, you could keep exploring your game plan. And that way, uh, you can always overcome such a challenge. And um, how do you, the second one I want to just touch upon is to how do you keep believing in you when someone says you can't? I think Sandra just, uh, just touched upon it. When, uh, when you're really against, when everything is against you, is where you have the biggest opportunity to become the best version of you. So always remember, when you are pushed to a challenge like that, that's, that's opening for you to be a best version of yourself. Uh, so, yeah, so that's something I wanted to start off with. Yes, Saroj, I agree 100% with your opinion, especially on the part about how we are supposed to discover our potential when we are thrown into the rough waters. I mean, sure. there's no choice. If we are thrown in there, we, we have to perform. And it's all about moving out of your comfort zone and taking up the challenges at the end of the day. And uh, Dr. Rohanta, what about your experience in this regard? Uh, let me initially thank uh, uh, the Rotary Club of uh, NIBM and uh, Ed Sip, right? Am I right? The, your partner? Yes, Ed Scale Up. Yeah, Ed Scale, Ed scale up. up. For actually organizing this event. I mean, when a lot of people are holidaying all over the country and including my good friend Sandra in, uh, in, in Butlam, uh, it's so great that you have uh, put, you know, you guys are yet focused to your purpose and, uh, you know, you are trying your best as to how you can share some kind of knowledge uh, to the membership. So, uh, I mean, thank you very much. And I'd like to put my hand up for you all. And uh, I, I really learned so much from uh, you all, from Rotaract and Interact, uh, the discipline, the, the kind of uh, aggressiveness that you guys have. Uh, you know, you, everybody's hiding behind COVID and sleeping underneath the chair, mm -hmm. but you all are kind of moving. So, uh, I mean, thank you so much. And you all don't know this, but to us, you know, you guys are the motivation that keeps us going. Okay. So that's uh, just, thank you very much. Uh, with regard to your question, um, um, my, uh, see, there are, uh, Irony, there are two, uh, two key learnings that I like to share. In the private sector, the most difficult challenge that all of us have is um, the public perception uh, and, and how much it distracts you, you know. Uh, Sri Lanka is a small country, you know. Everything is governed by gossip. Even if you look at the shares in the uh, stock exchange are governed by market sentiments, not on fundamentals, you know. So, you know, that's the kind of uh, a power that uh, gossip and uh, public perception has. So the, the biggest challenge that I have had in my private sector of working for multinationals like Beaver, Rekit and diversity lever in India is that, you know, never listen to the audience. That is not your game. You have a very clear game plan, which you have set aside, just like how the other speakers were saying, you must run on your track. And that was what my first boss told me. Um, um, don't look right, don't look left. You know, just like when you were doing athletics, you know, you run on your lane, don't listen to the audience. You know, you have your judges that will put your red flag up if you're crossing the line, but you know, you must run on your track. And, and I think that's one of the, the most important ingredients that is important in Sri Lanka because, because we are a small island nation, it's all gossip driven, you know? So that's the first challenge that I had then, whatever that I have achieved um, in the private sector, it's only because of that, not because of talent, I would say. 
it's only that sheer focus to say that i'm going to run on my lane and i'm going to only listen to my judges who tell me whether i'm crossing the line and not and and my coach who is guiding me to run that's it you know i'm not going to listen to the audience so so that's something that that is that is that is very important in today's world on the second side with regard to my public sector because you know i've been chairman of expo development board lanka satosa uh, sri lanka tourism um, you know and i've also headed the expo uh, in milan for sri lanka so i mean there i think the biggest challenge that i had was how can i stay honest you know it's very easy for people to say you know you must be honest but when somebody comes and gives you a check for 700 million and says can you sign this check and i'll give you 25 million i mean then only you realize that you're actually honest you know it's it's very easy for people to say i'm a very honest human being you know but so now at that point when you decide decide not to sign that check you know that you'll be sacked tomorrow the minister is going to call you and say i don't want you the reason why i appointed you as chairman is because i want you to sign you know i want you to do what i say now at that moment of time the challenge you have is are you going to stick to the values that you have been brought up with or are you going to succumb to the values of the world you know so in my life i have always stuck to the values that i have been brought up with and at the export development board i was given a check to sign which i refused i i gave my resignation and i left and then of course i remember 3 days after that the president calling me and saying you're not we heard the whole story you're not going anywhere you're going to head the economic council reporting directly to dr pb and you report to me you know so um then again when i was appointed chairman of lanka satosa you know we turned around the company within one and a half years to a 32 billion turnover um an operating profit of almost 65 million um you know all my private sector counterparts they did a fantastic job to support me from unilever to nestle to rekit to swadesh to you know all these companies and one day i was asked can you please sign a check for 723 million you know and and i mean there was no choice for us we said guys we don't take money you know we don't do that and i remember i took a i took my pen i i you know gave my resignation and i went down and i took a trisaw and i went back home i didn't even take the official land cruiser that they had given uh and and yes. next day it was all in the paper you know all over saying you know uh, uh, private sector lives up to the values so the point is that guys when you're young you sometimes want to get ahead and stick to what the world tells you to do never stick to do that you must stick yes, to your doctor. values so that then what happens is later on you keep on getting picked up by people but if you say just to keep my job i'm going to do something wrong you'll never get picked up after that you know so so these are the two key pickups that i like to share with you yes dr rohan the 100% on this because i understand that you know no matter how high we go up in our career it's always important that we stick to our values because integrity crowns everything else and uh, along with that i would like to ask uh, rasini about her experience in this regard rasini hi yeah lahiruni i hope i'm audible yeah so, yeah uh, if if i'm to think about challenges uh, i think um, life has been challenges and tough decisions all the way along just like what aru said i can clearly say that you know it's never about the destination it's all about the journey so for me i would say um when i'm small when i was small and then until up to a certain age i mean all i wanted to be was to become a gynecologist actually i wanted to pull babies out since the day i knew what a career is but unfortunately because of all the Uh, difficulties that i faced in life um losing my parents and you know really struggling with uh, them being ill and all those things and um, failing multiple times uh, i think i was i was a mess uh, to begin with so if there are any youngsters who are here who feel that you are a mess i think it's perfectly all right and uh, i think when it comes to decisions then the decision of me selecting this particular field that i am in which 
happened in a very accidental way. And I think um, I was bold enough to take that decision and uh, maybe uh, was crazy enough <laughs> to think that I can make a career out of it. I think sometimes in life, you have to take chances as well. You know, sometimes you have to follow your gut feeling also. And I think that was one of the best decisions in a very challenging situation that I took. And also, I think another, um, I would say a tough uh, decision and a, and, a, and a challenging decision was becoming a part of Mind Hills. When they first approached me saying that we want to open uh, an online counseling platform. And whereas uh, I kind of believed in the idea that, you know, what if you have a platform where any person can reach out to anybody at any given time, right? That you don't have to wait for a doctor in a hospital. You don't have to uh, have this uh, particular feeling of your confidentiality being breached when you're out there in the public seeking mental health support, right? And, uh, but the thing is, when I personally canvassed this around to some of the therapists and then they were like, how, how can this ever work? You know, you can't have online counseling ever working for any individual. And then COVID hit us, right? And, and to see everything became online, everything, everything was about online. And then to see, I mean, today I, I saw that Mind Heals, we started our first webinar one year before. And, and to see where we have come, that's a very long way. And we are spreading the importance of mental health, which I personally believe and, and, a, and a certain value system uh, given to me by, by my two amazing parents. And um, also spreading the awareness that uh, it's all right that you are broken, even if you are a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. It only established one thing that you are human. I am taking that message out. And I think every day that I go in, in front of any crowd, it's a very challenging thing. I don't think it's, it's ever not a challenge, right? Every new crowd is different. Every individual is different. And I'm, I'm thinking that um, I think because I have a purpose in life, uh, not a life that I'm expecting peace, uh, but a purpose. Therefore, I think it keeps me going. So any, any youngster over here, if you one day realize that it's never about um, having peace or you know or happiness or whatever, if you have a purpose, I think it just gives you that particular energy and, and that petrol or diesel that you need uh, to your system you know, to have that run. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. That's, that's indeed amazing feedback, uh, Rasini, because uh, I agree with you on like how you elaborated on the importance of mental health and kudos for your program, Mind Heals, because it actually reminded me of how important it is that we kind of, you know, get the therapy that we need for what's going on in our mind, because just because something is not visible does not mean that it's not heavy, right? So along with that, and also in terms of following your gut feeling and and also like trying to find out your potential because uh, I feel like when it comes to uh, one's undergraduate years like it's always a normal normalcy where people feel rather lost in in the in, in their in their years in the undergraduate period so and along with that uh, I would like to move into the second question of the day so what inspired all of you to be the leaders that you are today and uh, are there any role models that inspired you to step so high in your career ladder? Um, I'll start with Arus. Yeah, um, I think, um, you know, when we were small, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not too sure, but we did not have uh, much visibility on, on the external role models in terms of the kind of exposure uh, you know, people have today um, with regard to the kind of uh, social media, digitally connected world, you could read up, you can, you know, listen to uh, stories, a lot about external uh, leaders who have, who have done great in life. Now, uh, for me, uh, of course, when, when we started off, uh, when we were kids, uh, our influence on, on leadership or role models started at home. 
uh, like when we were kids, uh, the first role model for me is my own parents. Uh, you know, my mother and the father, the way they would conduct themselves, the way they would support each other and uh, the kind of influence and the impact they made uh, to us in our lives. And uh, of course, uh, after some time and we were just, uh, you know, really growing up, then it is the family members. And, and then when we started schooling, uh, it, is, it is the principal, the teachers, um, you know, the, the fellow uh, students. So literally you always looked up to within your own circle of influence. And they, they were the role models for us. And, you know, the principal was, was the role model for us in the school. It was my class teacher that was a role model for me. And they always taught you the values until we, we really became the teen, teenagers. We were given the values, uh, you know, and how to be a leader and why you should be a leader, uh, most importantly. So until I, I started my corporate career, I never had an external reader as a role model. Of course, uh, with the cultures that we grow up, grew up, uh, the kind of uh, environment, the beliefs, the religious and the cultural beliefs, all that had certain role models, which we have learned, uh, you know, really positive and, and constructive lessons. But for me, I think I would shift slightly from the question, uh, more than the role model, the way it shaped my life, I wanted to become a leader for myself. Now, you might be wondering what's, why, why you're saying that. Because most importantly, I wanted to be a leader for myself, my family, and, and whoever is around me, because I wanted to make a difference. Uh, because uh, in my uh, young days, uh, you know, um, I, I was again, I had to fight a lot of battles. And uh, it is like, if you're not privileged to kind of go into a certain school, if you're not privileged to have a certain level of uh, English education or knowledge, uh, the norm in the society is that uh, it's very difficult for you to get to where you want to go. So uh, I just wanted to uh, prove myself that, no, I mean, it's okay. I, it, it can always start. Maybe the start looks uh, very dark for you. Maybe it's not all, uh, you know, really nice the way it is. Um, but if you really work towards it, you can overcome all the odds and, and be a leader and eventually support of those who think who have challenges in life. So I would really like to bring about the story of, uh, apart from all those influences I got when I was a kid, uh, my biggest driver is initially is, is my own self into what I want to be. Uh, and that's how I would like to take this forward. Uh, yes, you could have role models today. I have a lot of role models that I would like to follow. Uh, you know, the great uh, Richard Branson, um, the Steve Jobs, you can go on talking about it. But uh, literally, the way I shaped up my life uh, or became a leader purely because I hold those real inspirations behind me to what I wanted to be. Yeah, yes, Arus. I'm actually fascinated by this uh, different perspective because sometimes there is a possibility that you may not have particular role models at all, but it all starts in you and you are your own role model. So, yeah. And uh, Sandra, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, well, actually what uh, Arus said was true. Growing up, we didn't have many role models, unlike now. Uh, but um, I think... Um, I started thinking about role models uh, probably only about 20, 25 years ago. Um, and for me, um, one of my greatest role models is actually my boss at Dialogue that I worked with for over 20 years, Dr. Hans Vijay Surya. Um, he, to me, uh, is the kind of person that I believe, I admire and believe that everyone should be like his humble, his uh, learner you can approach him anytime he's kind to animals uh, people um, a very simplistic manner in which he thinks um, and uh, above all i think he's very uh, human and very honest and so full of integrity um, and his knowledge and um, you know the, the way he gets about doing things um, beyond you know you think that an engineer is somebody who actually may not have too much of a human touch but uh, he's more human than I've known uh, most other people to be, very good with people management. So I've really uh, looked up to him along the last 24 years I've been working at Dialogue. Uh, before that, pretty much I can't think of a role model because I had bosses, in fact, I told you, who wanted me out of the job. Um, so that's one. Um, and then somewhere down the line, a more personal uh, role model before and after may have been the fact that I try to kind of look at uh, the good that I might pick up from um, not so much career success, but 
as an individual personal success i think of um you know whether it is uh, jesus christ uh, you know lord buddha they they had a certain simplistic way of living right in which they figured and even in our human lives i think mother teresa was like that mahatma gandhi was like that nelson mandela was that like that uh, where they kind of figured that there was a higher purpose in life that they you need to give off your time yourself uh, to not just for yourself uh, to be kind of selfish and self centered but more to do something more for the good of others um, and also the fact that um, you know you less is more uh, meaning i mean up to a certain point in time in my life i would have wanted to collect uh, a lot lot of things right? i want this i want that i want more shoes more handbags more clothes whatever right and it's never ending because when you want more you just want more and more and more and nothing is ever enough right i don't think it will ever be but then you come to a realization and a point in life you think that less is more more is not more so the less you have the more headaches you have the more trouble you have and enough just enough is good enough you don't have to have a, a huge amount of everything right because then like even if you have a lot more money lot more houses lot more things then you have to worry a lot more right you you don't you can't worry less you have to worry a lot more to protect everything you have so really i try to pick up uh, you know as role models a little bit of the good from all those people more from my personal life um, and i would say for my professional life uh, you know my boss dr hans which is indeed sanja because i understand how important it is for a person who is just starting uh, to have the exposure of uh, professionals in the field who are always willing to help us out and uh, along with that uh, i would like to um, ask the opinion of uh, dr rohanta are there any particular qualities in people that you recognized as role models that shaped your career yeah i think uh, this concept of role models uh you know is something that uh, it's good for good for people to have uh but as we become you know as the success model and our learning curves increase what happens is that we sometimes you know say that you know we are the best and we are the role model of the world you know it we normally do that but i think it's very important for us to be humble and to know there's somebody else better than you and it's good that you learn something from them you know so on that premise you know when we started life in marketing you always look at role models in marketing you know so i remember when we were studying marketing there was a guy called ravi fernando who was uh, a brand manager for astra and then you know he was fantastic brilliant Uh, and then he got picked up by smithline beecham winthrop to handle panadol and then subsequently got picked up to handle the whole of smithline business in uh, europe so so for us he was kind of the role model in in brand marketing and it was so funny but you know you know you know he, he, for us also from brands to senior brands to marketing management and suddenly i found him coming in as a ceo at rekit and and it was so fantastic to work with him and uh, and he was also quite hard i remember even after i won the marketer of the year award twice the first thing he did was he said ronta i wanted to go and work on the field as area manager you know i had tears in my eyes i said listen you know all my colleagues have never worked even one day on the field and you ask him me to go and work on the field for 6 months but then he said no but i want you to do that and i said okay great i'll work so after winning all the awards here was i you know uh, on the field working in a lorry yeah? okay uh, but then after 6 months he called me and said brilliant uh, i'm going to give you the top brand at all and and first of all you have to go and work in india uh, so you know uh, i think role models in sri lanka helps you shape life then of course when you move on uh, to more senior positions you'd start looking at people who are more into corporate and ceo roles and at that time again there was a fantastic guy called lalit dimel the first ceo in sri lanka to head a um, top 100 uh, uh, company globally you know and he was based in the uk 
and subsequently i think he became chairman of hemas and sri lanka telecom and boi he was brilliant and and he's the one who said don't never ever be dishonest for pressure and i and and he was one guy who always supported me when i told that i will never sign anything how powerful a minister is i'm not going to sign you know and uh, so he was kind of a role model and he's i think he's one of the best guys that i met um in the world of rotary i think i mean all of us have a role model there again and i think uh, this gentleman called k ravindran is is fantastic he went on to become the global president of rotary based in evanston uh, and why he's so fantastic is that you know how well he doesn't hurt people you know we have got into some very difficult situations in rotary but you know how well he handles it and make sure that his point is understood but he will not hurt you know and you can see that he is a his dna is rotary you know so so i think these are the three people that have um, fashioned uh, uh, my life yes dr rohanta it makes me realize how there is this whole Uh, exposure into different kinds of personalities whose characteristics have influenced your life for the better and uh, along with that uh, i uh, rasini any thoughts on any role model that uh, shaped who you are today well i think uh, when i when i think about a role model um lahiruni i think um, i would have to agree for what aru said i think for me my role models have always been my parents um especially i think my father uh, he was one of the uh, you know the top uh, government that he was in government administrative service and uh, been such a big personality everyone saw him like so big he was like larger than life for everyone even for me you know as kids we always take the pride of our parents and then you know start throwing their names here and there say you know what my papa is this my mother is this but the thing is what the, one of the beautiful things i saw in him at that time it wasn't beautiful believe me that he smashed my ego every th- time he saw it building up right he used to tell me you know what you are absolutely nothing without me you are just using your name and some day it will come your moment will come where you will have to build up your name and um, there were numerous times actually that he he did that to me and i think one of the most a brilliant teachings of his was that he told me that how would you ever recognize someone who's rich uh, as a person or, or you know in terms of everything a rich person then i was actually thinking about so many materialistic things to uh, fill it up but then what he said me uh, said to me was that you know it's uh, it's the way you are as a human the more it's it's absolutely how humble you are because he took the uh, example of a paddy he said that when it grows when it enriches it bends so that's exactly how a person whether you are educated whether you are rich in terms of you know materialistic things if you are rich in terms of knowledge or however the more richer you get that means the more humble you become so make sure you have that going in your life so i think even now lahiruni i think for me i always try to live up to that particular expectation of my parents uh, like how a good human should be or you know um, stay in this life and then do give back to human kind and i think i cannot find any any one else uh, other than i think my parents to be role models so if of course i i had like you know all these uh, actors actresses and you know whom you follow that happens but i would say inspiration now i think i get from every individual i meet in life and i think you know everyone's uh, journey is different the, their struggles are different and what you go through in life now it's going to be someone else's survival guide tomorrow so i think you know me meeting a lot of people even really small kids i think i am inspired every day looking at their little struggles and how they face their struggles you know there are little journeys even i think uh, for me always it will be my parents uh, and and i'm doing all the work that's also for them as well but at the same time i think i i derive inspiration from uh, 
so many individuals in life. Yes, Rasini, actually your experiences reminded me of my teenage years. I mean, the part about looking up to parents and the parents also coming up and smashing our egos, that part is just so, so relatable because I believe that uh, even though we may be grown up, we are just little kids. We would always be little kids uh, to our parents. And at the same time, we realize a couple of years down the line when we are grown up, we realize that they have been an inspiration all along. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much uh, for, the, for the opinions. And along with that, we'll be moving into the second area that we'll be, we intend to talk about in this discussion today. So we understand that when it comes to Sri Lanka, even though there is a larger population of women in numbers, we understand that there is a difference in terms of uh, leadership roles that are in the corporate sector or any other sector when it comes to the participation of women in leadership. So to share your thoughts on, uh, on women, on participation of women and their potential to pursue careers in the corporate sector, I would like to... Um, ask the opinions of Sandra with regard to any of the uh, challenges that she faced with regard to this kind of gender gap? Um, yeah, so I um, can reminds me, you know, of the very many challenges, one, uh, yet another one. So two significant challenges that I recall in my life. The first one I told you was at the start of my career and all the biases. And the second was when I was in my second job, um, I got married and I was pregnant uh, very earlier on, maybe like two years after I joined that company. And, um, you know, my, my boss told me, if I go on maternity leave for four months, nearly four months that you can have, that, uh, what, you know, if he can manage without me for four months, then he can manage without me forever. And that made me feel like, um, and, and I also had to hand over my duties sort of covering up duties to a young girl who was younger, uh, you know, sort of nicer in every way. And I was terribly insecure, thinking I was going to lose my job to her. Fact is, I would have lost my job to her. Um, but I decided that I had no choice. So although I have paid maternity leave of three, four, three, four months, three months or something, I actually went back to work in one month. Right. And to me, that should never have happened. It just so happened that boss was a foreign boss and, you know, I also didn't know my rights and all that. Anyway, even if I tried to go and apply my rights and go to labor or something and say that my boss thinks I need to come back to work, you know, during my maternity and all, I would have anyway lost my job because I wouldn't have been a part of that management team, you know, where he would have had me there. Uh, so I went back to work um, and, you know, I, I therefore I lost out on maybe spending some decent time with my newborn kid. Um, when I look back now, it's not something I would have ever done if I had to repeat it a second time, right? So something that I shouldn't have done. Um, and, and those are the challenges sometimes we are called upon, uh, perhaps sacrifices more or less, uh, when you are up there fighting in management, right? So uh, even in that team, I was the only female, there were no other females, they were all males. So I was having this, uh, be compared with the all male management team in which there was one female who was apparently maternity leave and wanted to be at home for three, four months. So that was not on par and it wasn't acceptable. So I, I came back. Ever since then, I've kind of uh, figured out that, you know, I need to match up or be better um, and that I would work, you know, work harder if I had to, uh, to prove myself to be equal on par or better when I come to the table. Um, and that way, and, and also I uh, don't want to be quiet anymore. I make sure that I have a voice at the table, that I have a seat at the table that I'm serving up, uh, and that I prepare for the conversation. And then, uh, you know, I'm there as an equal, um, male, females, young or old. Um, from that, I've learned that I don't worry too much about age with my own experience because I'm a boss. I make sure that age doesn't come into the picture and gender doesn't come into the picture at all, no religion or race, right? Um, to me, I, I don't see those things. I just don't look at all those things. Uh, when I see people, I look at people who are capable with the ability and the potential and, uh, you know, give, give everyone equal opportunity and don't have these 
uh, biases uh, with me uh, because I don't want what happened to me to happen to anyone else. And I'm always talking to the rest of my team saying that this is how it should be, that we should uh, never be hard on people uh, just because you know they are new moms or they have a situation or they're going through a divorce, maybe single moms. Uh, they have difficulties, and when, especially when you have kids, um, they fall ill, right? And parents have to take, I mean, mothers have to take time off. Um, and, and you can't expect them to work if your child is sick, right? Their mind is not at peace. Um, so you have to be more flexible and a little uh, giving um, in a way, men and women also, and equally men, uh, if they need it, uh, to be able to be understanding and flexible so if you are understanding and flexible then actually you get the you know you get more commitment loyalty and the best out of people yes sandra while we are at it can you elaborate a little bit also on the support that you received from your male counterparts yes um so i'm actually uh, i've always been in a male dominated workplace um a lot of the time uh, given that i'm in technology uh, but again um about 12 years ago, um, my boss, uh, Dr. Hans, kind of almost forced me into taking on his slot at uh, Slascom, which is Sri Lanka, you know, Association for Software Services. Uh, it's the IT BPM knowledge services chamber in the country. Um, and since he put me there, I wanted to make sure I do well for dialogue and for him. Um, and, and I kind of worked hard. At first, I felt a bit... Uh, bit uh, how would i say out of place because everyone around me for one thing was six feet tall because all those men somehow in it the ceos they all happen to be six feet tall um and i felt like a midget next to them uh, apart from that i was the only female that also made me feel different uh, and the third thing was they were all engineers and i was the only one who was not and that made, made me feel very awkward as well uh, but then uh, I realized that they look to me for different skills because we all have uh, strengths and different skill sets we bring to the table. Um, and those people, they really understood that. And they look to me for my strengths and my uh, skill set um, in human, man human relations, um, understanding people, uh, processes. I'm very process driven, um, uh, administrative skills. Um, and so, you know, empathy, so if you, emotional intelligence, right, managing very large teams. Uh, so there were lots of, and of course, from the fact that I was also from a technology background in terms of my experience, having worked 20, 20 30 years um, in the mobile phone industry, right, um, and services. So uh, after a while, I realized that they actually um, supported me, valued me. And they were willing to really back me up and help me along if I ever needed their help. So some seven years ago, they decided it would be nice to have a woman uh, as chairperson in this IT BPM male-led industry. Um, and they consciously decided, and at the time I said, are you, I can't do it. No way, no way, you know, this is not gonna happen. And they said, of course, we are gonna back you up all the way. We're gonna make sure it happens and you're going to come on the management committee on the board and uh, work towards being the chair chairperson. So now I'm the vice chair. Uh, in June this year, I will be elected as chairperson, uh, which means I'll be the first female, you know, in an IT BPM uh, chamber, uh, male dominated industry, and also someone who's not uh, a software engineer, right? Uh, taking for, so yes. uh, I've been able to do that because of the fact that some amazing men and women, of course, but amazing men. And I can think of 10, 20, 30, 40 of them uh, or more who've just helped me in every possible way, rallied around me, cheered me along to, to get to that. Um, and so you know that men are not against you. You cannot be against men. At a certain point in life, it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, right? It doesn't matter about caste, uh, qualifications, religion, background, social status, nothing of that matters. It only matters that you have a deep respect for another human being, for their strengths and what they bring to the table and that you're working for a common cause. Um, 
uh, is what really matters. So I think that's what I've learned uh, from my 30 odd years of experience working in corporate sector. Yes, Sandra. So continuing along the lines of uh, what Sandra elaborated, it's it's obvious that there is a general tendency that some occupations have more male participation as opposed to female counterparts. Now, um, like, what are the possible reasons that must have caused this kind of gap in numbers when it comes to leadership? Arul, any comments on this? I'm sorry, Arul. Um, yeah, so Sandra, congratulations. I think it was really inspiring to hear that you're going to really again set uh, uh, another milestone in, in Sri Lankan industry. So fantastic, uh, Sandra, for that. But um, I mean, coming back to the question, I think, um, yes, now if you look at the Sri Lankan, uh, the whole employment sector, there are some visible trends that is showing that females have taken a, you know, a, a larger contribution against uh, the men. Now, if you look at if you look at the whole uh, Sri Lankan economy, there was a the labor survey. The last was done in 2018. According to it, uh, that this it showed that if you look at the the three pillars of Sri Lankan economy, that is, um, you know, industry, uh, agriculture, and uh, of course services, you could see that uh, in agriculture uh, there is larger women participation than men. Obviously, we know all know where it's coming from. It's coming from the plantation sector. If you look at the industries the men and the women is almost the same. Again, it's, it's largely coming from the apparel sector or any of the industries. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the services sector, uh, you see that male are more contributing than female. But uh, what we are really discussing, uh, like uh, we, I remember this, Sandra brought up this point in our previous uh, you know, icebreaker session. It's not just the numbers. I think it's, it's about, our conversation is about uh, can uh, is women in disadvantage to any of these uh, professions? Now, if you if you further analyze those numbers, you could see that uh, in education industry, uh, women play a larger role, uh, fairly uh, higher than a men uh, counterpart in education industry. It's both in public as well as in private. So, education industry uh, and then healthcare industry. If you take uh, again, I'm just again talking about that is more relevant, very critical roles uh, to, to a country like ours. Uh, now, what is also even fascinating is that uh, when I looked into further numbers, we see that professional, if you look at the female contribution, the largest contribution for female employment comes from professionals in this country. The contribution from women is at 12%, while for men, it is almost close to 6.9% of professionals. So first thing I wanted to say that if, if ever a, a lady or a woman feels that they are disadvantaged in this country, it is not. But we all know there is, a one, there is one problem when it comes to leadership positions. Again, it's a way we are looking at it. If you want to define corporate sector and if you want to define leadership as being a CEO, uh, then we would have a problem. But, but I think Sandra just touched on that. Uh, the reason for this is that the many other areas, you see, wherever relevant, wherever women can add more value, you, you can very clearly see that they have been, they have been doing quite well. They've been quite successful, right? So uh, now certain sectors, like for example, services, uh, if you take the wholesale retail, or you know, the whole um, retail sector, uh, that women participation is one of the lowest. The reason is the way the, the retail and the wholesale sector has been designed in our country, it is not a very uh, women friendly. I mean, if you, um, I mean, for example, if you take a sales rep who has to go and sell to every single shop uh, till about starting from 7.38 to about maybe late, very late in the night. Now that's that type of a job. It's not conducive for uh, uh, women to kind of really engage. But on the other hand, if you see some of the, like I said, the healthcare sector, the education sector, they are quite uh, affluent. I mean, they're contributing quite, well, to that. Now, leadership also, you could see certain type of industries. If you look at Sri Lanka, I mean, Sandra is, is a great example, you know, telco uh, to start with uh, finance, uh, maybe banking and insurance. Uh, if you look at, there are multiple C-level leaders in, in, in women. Uh, and also, if you look at certain C-level positions, like HR pri primarily is dominated uh, in Sri Lanka, is mainly female. Now, we need to always understand why is that certain uh, roles are very suitable for women. It comes with their skill set and it comes with their innate ability to resonate with people. 
why people trust on hr uh, to be a women more than i mean i'm not these are not my words if you if you go uh, center for creative leadership it's a global center for leadership they did a research of 745 global executives in 120 countries they said women can rely on women for organizational support and men also rely on women for organizational support when it comes to men uh, they looked at men and female as equal but when it comes to female they said my female boss understand uh, my emotions much better than a male so there is a quality that uh, you know we can i can if i have to relate this uh, a women is, is holding the most noble position in the world that's motherhood you know you can't be a mother without really having that you know beautiful skill of resilience and, and you know a beautiful skill of emotional uh, intelligence about dealing with emotions of people there is no one who can calm down uh, a child than a mother so that goes same with the organization so what we are saying is that those women who possess those qualities should be absorbed organization should now think of having the women in the lead, lead uh, you know leadership roles because another research carried out by harvard uh, hbr article that talks about how important to have uh, women leaders in the c suite level because it is enhancing the value of the organization i mean it's a long article i don't want to go into detail but the crux of it is it says how value adding it for to have women leaders in the in the board and at a c level how innovative the organization become how emotionally balanced the organization become so unfortunately, there is no awareness or lack of awareness. We think uh, that women are not, uh, you know, really adding value. But there are positions that women can add value, and research has proven it uh, year on year. So I think we need to be very consciously lo looking after. I mean, looking for those opportunities, those skill sets that women can really bring in to the larger organization to benefit from. So that's what yeah. I have. To say. Yes, Arus, I think you really brought out the bigger picture that is involved in terms of uh, women leadership and their tendency to follow career opportunities. And I also understand the part about each career opportunity having special circumstances, uh, which, which can be largely, you know, different. And depending on that, there can be a difference in numbers as well. So along with that, I would like to move into the third area for discussion wow. today. Yeah, and uh, this is on the importance of maintaining the work-life balance. Um, Rasini, any thoughts on, as a psychologist, uh, any experiences that you have encountered with regard to maintaining work-life balance? Lahirini, I'm also trying to uh, find uh, the balance. <laughs> 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 to be very honest, here now I would like to say, you know, um, see a lot of people just ask me and then you know for you know how can you do time management how can you do work life balance but the issue is that you know see i can't make a certain framework and shove everybody inside that particular framework you know i can't have one size one one clothing item right where i can fit myself arus and dr rohan and sandra all all of us over here right it will not happen it's not possible it's not practical Right. So basically, when it comes to work life balance, I think what people should really understand is how and uh, what do you really want to prioritize in life. <clears throat> so that is, I think, number one. And also, I think uh, if, if you looking to the perspective of maybe from a woman's perspective here, I think uh, us women are pretty much uh, not accountable for the right things in life. You, are account you feel that you, know, you are accountable and you are responsible for everything, right? Even if someone does that job, still you're not happy. I mean, for example, let's say if your child falls sick, then as a mother, you feel so guilty if you're unable to go. Let's say someone else attend to that, you still feel guilty, right? You are still not entirely happy with the fact that, you know, you are still in doubts, oh my God, would you? you know whether he or she took care of it properly or whether it you know whether she or he was there on time and all that thing it means you are not ready to give that portion away you love to be responsible right but the thing is what we need to realize is and understand is we need to uh, we need to understand ourselves and what our priority is right and then uh, see whether with those things and with the right kind of help or, you know, how can you then have a 
balance of everything. I mean, for example, let's say if you have a possibility of uh, seeking domestic help, right? If you have a possibility or else like if you have to put your child in day, daycare, if you let's say you're a young mother, right? And you have this problem of putting your child in daycare and then you have nobody to take care. So again, I think not being guilty of the fact that you are working and your child in daycare, that particular piece you have to build within yourselves first of all, right? So then only like when you, when you not become guilty for all those things that's happening around you, right? Then you can pretty much with peace find that work-life balance that you are looking at. Well, balancing, I think constantly as individuals, we will struggle at any point in life. This balance goes for a six, right? Most of the time, especially when something unexpected happened. I mean, for example, a lot of people who were balancing so many things in life suddenly, uh, you know, lost all that balance when COVID hit. And even very young individuals, you'd never had to be married, you know, you know, even when you were in a relationship and people found it very difficult, very tough to maintain everything, you know, the work and the studies and all of that. I mean, I know for a fact that even very, very young kids, teenagers, everyone struggled. And so this is not entirely on women mostly, but because of the fact that women are expected to, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that, you know, to have these particular few roles, uh, maintaining these few roles that they play in life very well. And that also the fact that, you know, they feel so guilty that if they're unable to live up to the expectation of fulfilling these particular roles, I think that is why a lot of us, we lose that balance that you are referring to okay so here prioritizing what you really want in life and also understanding that all these things it was absolutely a choice that you made in life so that is why yeah. I said you're not accountable for the right things see okay. if you decided to study that's a choice you made right if you decided to work that's a choice you're making Right? If you are deciding to do higher studies, let's say you are doing a job, you are not happy, you want to do higher studies to get into a better position, that's a choice you are making. So then let's say you are working and you decided to do an MBA and then you can't be going, oh my God, you know, I have this, I have that, I have all these things, I'm not getting enough support. Then if you feel like you're not having enough support, then reach out to someone like, to, for support. Right? And I think that is where sometimes we advocate mental health. They said it's okay not to be okay. Right? So talk to someone, reach out to a friend, right? talk to your team leader or your boss about the struggles that you are going through. Just because you keep it inside doesn't mean that there are going to be a solution. Solutions will come if you seek solutions. Right? So I can't yeah. exactly tell you how you're going to have a certain balance but it's always you need to prioritize what you basically want in life be accountable for the decisions that you have taken in life then absolutely be brave and bold enough to seek help uh, when you need help right even, yes, even let's say if you are struggling as a wife at home then i think you need to voice out the fact that you are struggling your husband is not almighty to understand the struggles that you are going through just because you stare at him you frown at him doesn't mean he'll get it <laughs> you need to say it right saying that you know i need your support right let's say somebody is not getting support right? let's say somebody is actually facing something like domestic violence or, or any any maybe abusive relationship then you always have a choice of walking out even if you're going through something like that, you always have a choice of, you know, seeking help, right, to solve your problem. So you need to attend to solve the problem, right, because we, we constantly we dwell in the problem. We do not want to seek, uh, I would say, a solution to it, right? So we, we are constantly focusing on the problem, right? Okay, we have a problem in work-life balance. I have everything to deal with. I have work to do. I have to. I have a house to run. I have, you know, studies to do. And you constantly are worried about it. You are not seeking a particular solution for it. I think I learned this thing from Arus actually one day. He just, uh, I think randomly, he just told me, you know, the, as long as you dwell in a problem, you're never gonna find a solution. You need to seek a solution 
to actually find a solution. If you seek only, you will find it. Right. So, and, and also, uh, Lahiruni, just to add a very small thing, I mean, people always ask about stress when it comes to the work life balance or so ultimate uh, after effect is actually stress. And stress is actually uh, something that is perceived uh, by an in individual. It's never like, for example, if all of us face the same kind of situation, our reaction will always be different, right? For Aruz, it will be different. For me, it will be different. Dr. Rohan, it will be different. For you and for Sandra, it will be very different. Our response to stress is very different because of the fact our estimate of it, right? So yes. that's not equivalent to everybody. Somebody can take the stressful situation as something that, you know what, this is a challenge and it's, it's to, for me to move forward in life, right? But somebody can really get into depression. So it's the way you look at it, right? So this is, I think these are very, very basic fundamental things that you need to understand. So I can't exactly tell you a, a, a dress that fits all of us saying, this is what you need to do in order to main, have a very good work-life balance. It all yes, what you want to prioritize, how you are going to prioritize it, and how bold are you to actually seek support or help. Yes, 100% on that, Chasini. I understand that for you, when it comes to the concept of work-life balance, it's a matter of prioritizing and being accountable. Now, I'm just wondering whether the approach is the same for the men as well. Now, when it comes to women, I understand what Rasini uh, told us about women being excessively concerned about everything and wanted to have the perfectionist approach and not being satisfied even if another person does, uh, does the job in her place. Now, Dr. Rohanta, any perspective? on work-life balance? Is it the same for you as well? Or would you be having a different approach? See guys, um, in, in, in today's world, you know, they, you have to understand that you can't compartmentalize and say, you know, you, know, you have your work and then you have your uh, uh, social life, your family life, uh, you know, your sports and, you know, I mean, you, you, it's, it's tough to compartmentalize now. Um, what, what is important is to know that if you're not going to, uh, you know, dribble with all these balls, you know, and allow one of those balls to fall on the ground, you know, you're going to have a situation where, you know, things are going to be challenging. So you have to decide as to how you will incorporate um, each of these facets uh, on your daily life and, and how you keep each of these balls dribbling. Uh, and if you don't learn that skill, if you don't um, um, understand that that is the new normal that is required, uh, you know, you, you can't, uh, uh, you can't, you can't uh, continue. I mean, there's no chance. I mean, uh, for instance, you know, uh, if you take today, before I came here, I would first go to the gym, you know, I'll, I'll work out at least for two hours, you know, and then, you know, I, I'll take a shower and quickly hit back for this. So if you don't know how you're going to manage your work life, it, it's tough. Now, for example, if you take my son, he, you know, he, he, he's a sportsman. He's ranked number 11 in the world for karate. He's, uh -huh. uh, so he's Sri Lanka number one. He's South Asia number one. And he's ranked number four in Asia. So, I mean, it, it's, it's tough. Now, how do I manage his, uh, how do I manage his career while I'm also managing my career? You know, how do I handle this? It's, it's, a, it's a very tough Thing. I mean, last or two weeks back, he said um, that I want to, my coaches, the Sri Lanka coaches pushing me to uh, get into the high performance team. So I said, what do you want to do? He said, you know, I, I want to fight at the next um, uh, trial. So I said, yeah, so go ahead and do it. I mean, you've been traveling all over the world fighting. So why don't you do this? He said, well, yes. But uh, this time I'm fighting a guy who's 25 years old, who is a full-time fighter in, in the forces. <coughs> so, I mean, I told him, guys, I mean, I don't think you're ready. 
I mean, how do you fight a guy who's 25 years old, you know? So now, how do you balance this? I mean, the first thing that you would want to do is to tell the guy, don't do it. But then you know that, you know, you have to, I mean, our parents allowed us to do our thing and we fall on the ground. So you have to allow people to do it, you know? So I said, guys, it's challenging. You might get hurt because <clears throat> these guys are full contact, you know? And, and <clears throat> it was very difficult for me. So I went there and I was watching. And, <clears throat> and the next thing I realized that is that some mistake had happened and his opponent got his whole face bashed up, his front teeth had broken and, and he was unconscious, you know. Now, <laughs> I mean, end of the day, he's also somebody's son, no? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> so my job was about how to get the ambulance and get the guy to National Hospital. And I was like right across working, trying to see as to how to get this fellow out of this situation. I mean, he regained balance and he's got back to training. But then how do, you, how do I manage somebody else's career? You know, it's, it's tough, you know. And, and, and it was the experience that this guy is small, you know, I mean, he's not that way driven. So, so you have to know how to juggle between the two. There's nothing like saying, you know, you have to compartmentalize things. You, you have to balance as to how you're going to manage each of these balls. And if you drop one of them, you know, you, you, you crash, you know, so it's tough, you know. Yes, Dr. Rohant, completely on, completely with you on that. Yeah, and I understand that uh, the pressure can be equal for men as well. And uh, depending on the circumstances, uh, there can be so many difficult situations where you have to really juggle everything, as you said. And uh, this actually uh, brings us uh, to the end of the discussion that we've had today. And it is indeed insightful because I feel like we have covered many aspects and uh, but before we wrap, up, wrap off uh, for this evening, I would like to ask uh, Sandra about, about the one piece of advice that she would give individuals who are aspiring to follow her footsteps. Sandra? Yeah, I would uh, give the advice that I have taken myself. Um, okay. And uh, they are very fundamental. There's no secret sauce, no miraculous uh, something. Um, just very, very simple fundamentals. I'd say first be honest, uh, make sure you build credibility by, uh, you know, walking your talk, by saying what you do and doing what you say. Um, so build that credibility. Um, work hard uh, because if something comes to you in life easy, it's not gonna, it's like easy come, easy go. It's not gonna last, right? So there are no shortcuts to success. It's not like a lottery. You have to slowly work your way through. Um, like Aru said in the beginning, stay focused on your game, know your game, be focused and work hard uh, conscientiously to make sure that you are making small steps and taking small steps towards your success or towards your goal every single day. Now, if you try, uh, the next thing of course is about living in the moment. So if you live in the moment, you will not be very stressed because you're not thinking about yesterday and the past and what's going to happen in the future and tomorrow and oh my gosh, this and that. You are going to do the best you can today, right now, right here, right? And if you continue to do it that way, you will slowly try to, in your journey of excellence, you will forge and move forward uh, being better than you were yesterday, today. And tomorrow you will be better than you were yesterday, right? Uh, I believe a lot of the fight when it comes to people is within yourself. I think you need to focus on being the best version of yourself, being the better you, and um, not really look at comparing yourself with everybody else around and trying to uh, work on these negative energies of cutting people down, as we saw the whole Mrs. World fiasco yeah. that brought disrepute okay. to our country, right? Now that's not what we want. So particularly women, I think uh, there's a little saying that I've seen a lot saying, be the kind of woman that will straighten another woman's crown. 
right? And not trying to bash it down and take it away, as we saw happening, which was disastrous, right? Uh, that kind of makes, uh, you know, women look very horrible people, which we are not, right? For the most part, uh, we are all kind and gentle, and honest and sincere, and try to help and try to do what's best for <clears throat> others. So working on that uh, is the aspect I think uh, we should do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's generally a nice recipe for success. Yes, and uh, Dr. Rohanta, any powerful take-home messages for anyone who is willing to pursue a career in the corporate sector? See, I think the, the, the most important thing that people must understand is that if you look at Sandra and Rasini and Arus and I mean, all of us, we are very average people. And the only reason why we got ahead is because, you know, we have been sincere to the friendships that we have had. I mean, I've been knowing Sandra for so long, you know, and, 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 you know, I sit on these women in management awards and, and, you know, I remember when I told Sandra, I met her at church and said, Sandra, I want you to apply for these women in management uh, World Bank Awards. He said, Ranta, I don't, we don't, you're not allowed to take awards. And I said, no, you have to get it. I'm going to talk to Hans and I'm going to make sure that you apply for this. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, it's just that you value somebody's talent. You know, I mean, if you take Arus, I mean, I know how much he has helped me. I mean, I have taught Arus on the masters and I know this award that came from Rotary also is, I, I went at eight o'clock in the night once and I said, Arus, we don't have any money, please help. And he said, I'll call the top ad agency in Sri Lanka and I will sponsor it from Renko. You know, and, and, and he, that template came from him. And today it's a global award, you know? I mean, so I don't know Rasini personally, but I know that she was fantastic at ICBT Australia, road track function and Dushan came and said she was fantastic. So. It's, I think, all about being sincere to people, you know, and and in the day, we are not here to catch the world. We are here to help other people grow. And if you have that kind of mentality uh, is what is important. And that's why I even thanked you, um, uh, uh, Lahiruni, that, you know, while everybody is uh, partying and holidaying in Norelia and all over the place, and my son, my friends and in Puttalam, Right. <laughs> I mean, you guys are trying to hear, ask, how can I help the community of road track in, in IBM? Uh, is there something that I can serve? So you guys are an example to us. You know what I'm saying? So it's that that's I think my 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 parting thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Rohanta. Like uh, the encouragement that we receive from established professionals like you. It's always memorable and uh, it'll always help us in the time to come. And uh, with that, uh, we'll be wrapping up the session for this evening. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Rohanta, Sandra, Aruz, and uh, Rasini for being a part and parcel of this discussion. It was a Sunday, but still, despite all of your personal commitments, you made sure that you were there for us. So we are extremely grateful uh, for, for being accommodating enough uh, to share your knowledge and your experience with us. And also thank you so much, the organizing committee, the Rotterdam Club of the National Institute of Business Management, Ed Scale Up and Isaac of University of Colombo for making sure that this happened. And uh, thank you so much and have a pleasant evening. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lahiri. Good luck to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you.